I think during the course of, of Cheltenham Festival Week, if if my memory isn't deceiving me now, a year on and with so much water under the bridge, you you felt the the mood changing rapidly. Yeah, we talk about nowadays how the news cycle goes through revolutions much faster than it used to. And of course that communicates to the public mood as a whole. And I think when you arrived on Monday, Cheltenham Festival Week, and there were some questions in the media about whether a, a large scale sporting event should go ahead as the pandemic was just starting to become more of an issue. And we'd seen some horrific images of the hospitals overflowing in Italy. And that really was about the British public's consciousness level at the time. You know, there were questions on that Monday, I think, as to whether it was appropriate, but I don't think anybody uh, working in or around the Cheltenham Festival at the time would have said to you, this, this meeting shouldn't be going ahead. You know, there were hand sanitizers everywhere. They were encouraging people not to touch each other. You know, that in itself was, was unprecedented. The government were advising that it was fine for sporting events to take place. So on that Monday, Tuesday, you didn't really feel there was any issue. Now, clearly, the first really significant manifestations of the pandemic in Britain started to take hold during the course of that week. And as the, as the news gathered pace, Cheltenham came under increasing scrutiny. It was right in the eye of the storm at exactly the wrong time. And by Thursday, I was doing quite a bit of work before I would go on air to, to some of the, the corporate hospitality venues and, and speaking at you know, rooms full of six, 700 people. Well, by Thursday, those 600 seats that had been sold were down to about 300. And in some of the corporate hospitality, people just weren't turning up. And by, by Gold Cup Day, those chalets and marquees and temporary facilities, I'm not saying they were empty, but they were a bit of a ghost town. And by Friday, people who hadn't paid for tickets, people who were invited there uh, on, a, on a, 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 a free day out, on a hospitality day out, if they had the option, they weren't turning up. That's how the mood of the country had shifted during Cheltenham week. So to answer your question, and I realize I've answered it in a very roundabout way, what you felt leaving there on Friday was very different to how you'd felt walking in there on Monday. And you also mm. felt when you left on Friday that pretty much the game was up for the sport in terms of a continuing uh, continuing event yeah, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the short and medium term. We got, when we got to Cheltenham on the Sunday or the Monday, whenever it was, for the week, we started to understand that as the week played out, this could, this was a very fast moving and changeable thing. One thing I do know from being at Cheltenham and from how that week unfolded and speaking to the authorities to the level I did, the publicity they got for it going ahead was, in my opinion, it, it's wrong. Like coronavirus isn't to the level that it's at in this country or didn't get to the level it's at in this country because of Cheltenham races. I think once we realised we were coming back, I, I think the one thing that I think we, we as ITV got right more than anything was, was the tone of our coverage because it's quite difficult to go on screen and then go, our oh, racing's back, isn't that great? When for a lot of people, their life and their world had been turned upside down by this virus. So having that balance between understanding that people are and have been struggling and dealing with this awful thing for a long, long time, but also a recognition that actually, hopefully, we can provide a distraction or whatever it may be. And I think that those meetings that we had, and there were lots of them to make sure we did get that right, and the, the preparation and, and professionalism of the team that we work with came to the fore. Um, I think those are something that we should be very proud of because, like I say, I think of all the things that we did and there's lots of technical uh, amazements with it, but fundamentally at its core, I think what we got right was was making people feel safe with us watching ITV racing, um, get distracted from the sort of the challenges that COVID and the, you know, the awfulness of COVID um, without gloating or um rubbing it in in any way or, or or not appreciating the bigger much bigger picture well it, it's a challenge because as we've discussed not having fans there and whatnot and and i did a i did the afternoon coverage actually for cheltenham in november or december i think it was and frodon and bryony frost won, and she came back into the winners enclosure now normally that horse would get an almighty cheer and it was really flat it was well there was no one there 
um, that will be the bit where we all need to lift it, I think, when the horse goes from the line to the winner's enclosure. I think the getting the tone right was probably one of the key things editorially. Um, just as important for the first one back, frankly, was the technical side of things um, and the logis logistical side of things because, I mean, June developed very quickly for us. The first weekend back was the Guineas, I think, at Newmarket, or it mm. was a meeting at Newmarket. Um, and that was entirely done pretty much from people's houses. So the presenters were in the houses, uh, the director, the producer, I was in my parents' lounge. Um, and that relied on, I mean, frankly, I'm amazed we got through it all without more technical hiccups, which is full credit to the technical team, because even they would, you know, they were having to do things they'd never done before. We've introduced some segments. Um, so like the Reliant on Racing segment, which, you know, is intended to try and showcase the breadth of the industry and the importance of it to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, we created an email address for that. And, you know, the idea behind that was to get people to send in videos for content. But I mean, I checked the inbox for that. That is full of people, um, you know, sending really nice messages about how they are enjoying the coverage, what it means to them. You, there are, there are, it is quite something I wasn't expecting. It. You look through and there's just loads of people saying like, you know, I used to watch the racing with my, my husband, he sadly passed away, but you know, your coverage is providing that light in lockdown for me. And it, it, there's, there's a lot of comments like that, which, um, you know, I, I do share onto the team and Ed and people like that. And um, you know, that, that I think we've tried to, read out some of those on air as well, which hopefully increases the connection between the viewers and us as kind of one wider community. In it. it was difficult because obviously you're not used to it. And as you say, a commentator feeds off crowd reaction and the crowd feed a lot of the time off what a commentator is saying as well. And obviously with, with nobody there, um, it was a very, very strange, uh, very strange environment um you you wondered how excited to get if there was an event of a close finish because again obviously in that instance usually uh you'd hear a lot of crowd noise below you um but there wasn't any so it was it was quite strange um particularly that first day at, at weatherby and obviously that was the the start of everything really beginning to kick off seriously wasn't it so um so ultimately the mood that day was was pretty pretty glum in any case and um yeah obviously now I've got used to it I've called to one crowd since that day at Weatherby that was at Catterick um over Christmas um and yeah they were completely poles apart that meeting and, and pretty much anything else I've done in the last year I've done one meeting with a crowd uh, since the pandemic started um and that was at Catterick over Christmas and I think they allowed 800 people in, which for that meeting they usually get getting on for 3,000 people in at that meeting. It's usually packed because um, Catholic only sort of holds that, that many people anyway. Um, but as I say, they let in, I think it was one of the pilot events where they were able to allow people in. So they let eight, 800 in and they capped it at 800. And there was a, a terrific atmosphere and bearing in mind as well, being over the Christmas period, it wasn't necessarily a racing crowd. It was more of a holiday crowd. There were um, yeah, quite a few children present, families, um, they were really up for it. It was a, a run-of-the-mill card. You know, there were no sort of standout races. It was just a good competitive afternoons racing at Catterick Bridge, what we mm. get used to. And um, but the atmosphere was was terrific. And in a way, you got the sense that people were just glad to be allowed to be able to have a day out um, mm. the back at the races as well. And it was it, it was terrific. And and yeah, in terms of uh, mentally and the satisfaction I got. It made me feel quite nostalgic what I've been missing out on and uh, and generally what people have been missing out on. Um, it was it was certainly not the the crowd that we usually get at that meeting, but the noise was was just as loud as it ever would be. People were were really up for it. They were in a good mood. They were obviously allowed to come racing and and they enjoyed some terrific racing that day. And it was just great to be able to voice over that day because um, it's certainly something that that as a commentator I miss. And obviously, at the beginning, there was there was no sort of indication from 
from the government and we've not all been entitled to to various um grants and things um along those lines but there was no sort of indication from the government at the start that we would be getting any financial help so obviously it was quite a um a worrying time um and on a personal note especially for myself because i was expecting uh, my wife was due to, to have a baby later later that year and uh, and obviously becoming effectively out of work in the months leading up to the birth is, is far from an ideal scenario. And there was no indication of, of when racing would return. There was a little bit of speculation, but the early dates that were given, you never really thought that they were realistic. Um, and I think that the BHA did a, a tremendous uh, job in working um, hand in hand with the government over getting racing back as soon as it could possibly resume. Um, and I was just very, very grateful for for the beginning of June when that kicked in and we can actually start earning some money again. I'm very appreciative of the position that I'm in. And as you say, the fact that I'm able to earn a living by going racing when on the whole people can't even go at the moment for a day out, whereas I'm able to earn a living watching racing, being up close and personal with these horses, doing what I love. I just feel very appreciative of being in that position um and you get good days as a commentator on course you get bad days and um you know even through some of the the days where I feel like I haven't had the greatest uh, day commentating wise it's it's still it, it just shakes you up really it's a a bit of a reality check what I what I'm actually doing and I'm very grateful for that it was an incredibly difficult decision you know, the reality of anyone in newspaper publishing is the first cardinal rule is you don't stop publishing. You know, that's the daily newspaper. You have to put it out there. So it's completely unthinkable that you do it. And, um, you know, we'd, we'd been through, you know, a few small crises in the past, things like equine flu and stuff like that. And we'd kept publishing um, because we felt it was our responsibility to our readers, to the industry. There's still news happening. There's still um, a lot to report on. Obviously, a, a pandemic like this, with its associated shutdown of society and, of course, of sport, put us in completely unparalleled circumstances. And the reality was we had to look at our business, and uh, just like every other business around the country did, and think, how are we going to survive this period when we have virtually no revenues, the sport's not taking place, people are being told by the government to stay at home, to only make essential journeys. And we kind of came to the, the conclusion, which was very difficult, but, but one that we, we felt was clear that the, the best thing for the racing post was to effectively go into a period of semi-hibernation, to stop the, the daily newspaper, to furlough the vast majority of our staff and, and for, for all of those remaining to, to be asked to take a quite steep salary cuts. Um, just in order that we could get through this period, which of course at the time we had no idea how long it would last and we didn't know how long our business's cash reserves would last and how long we'd be able to keep going even at this, this much reduced rate. Now, I think what happened then is, is you know, a small team of about 25 of us remained on um, to keep the digital services running on, on app and on web did an absolutely tremendous job and it was really important we did that because you know first and foremost we had to keep everyone involved in racing informed about what was happening what was happening in britain what's happening in ireland and around the world what the support measures were and, and how they could tap into them and also of course to provide our readers with some sort of escapism basically as, as everyone was stuck at home yeah, yeah. Um, desperately trying to find something to amuse themselves after having finished netflix um <laughs> So we kept going and, you know, but as soon as it sort of, we started to see the um, the, the trajectory of, of the pandemic and we could see that cases were coming down and, and that governments had a, you know, a, a route out of the restrictions, we started planning to return. And we were always very clear that we wanted to bring the paper back. And the only thing that would have stopped us from doing that was, you know, a complete catastrophe where the business was unable to continue and thankfully we never came to that stage or close to it so we were very keen to for it to return and we knew that when racing returned it gave us an opportunity to to relaunch the the newspaper and um, you know that's not something that happens every day uh, in print journalism so it was quite an exciting period for me and my staff as well and that, i mean that's another thing that 
was completely unthinkable. You know, newspapers are produced in newsrooms and we could never have conceived um, 18 months ago that we would go fully remote. And in fact, at first, we, we, we actually kept some people in the office because we were so convinced that going totally remote was going to be problematic. But the reality was, in fact, it's, it's, it's worked remarkably well. Um, you know, a couple of elements which have been actually really positive from it is that we have a dispersed workforce and, you know, even in ordinary times, while we're headquartered in London and a lot of our editorial staff would work out of the office, um, we also have teams in Ireland, we have reporters in the training centres of Lambourne and Newmarket in the north and the west country, we have a Paris correspondent, and all these guys are always working remotely. And so what going remote allowed us to do is to actually bring them in to all the daily conversations we have about how we're planning our news coverage so you know like other newspapers we have a morning conference where we discuss you know what the, the big stories are that day what features we have planned how we're going to tackle stories and that used to be sort of 10 to 12 quite senior guys in a room in london discussing it now we've opened that out we get people calling in from all around the world from race courses and we have a much more vibrant discussion uh, as a result. We've, we've lined up in a, you know, I think uh, our best ever team for it. Um, you know, is this, gonna, is this going out before or after Chelsea? Uh, just before. Just before, that's okay. I'll give you an exclusive. Okay, um, thank we've, you. We've got uh, Bryony Frost and Katie Walsh joining us for the week. Um, Bryony talking about her rides and Katie will be looking giving an analysis of, of, of the day's action. So really excited about that. And of course, they'll be joining, you know, the stalwarts of the Racing Post, people like Alistair Down, Paul Keeley, Tom Segal. So and we've got a really strong lineup. Um, and a key part of what we're going to be doing is, is trying to bring Cheltenham to our, our, our readers and make them feel part of it and, and capture some of that magic that Cheltenham has, you know. I, I keep saying this to my team that, you know, this is such a unique Cheltenham because it's not just the fact no one's there. It's the fact that no one is in the office. No one's in the pub. No one's in the bookies. No one's around their mates watching it. Everyone is going to be sat at home. And so you have this totally unique situation where 70,000 people who would have been at Cheltenham, hundreds of thousands of people who would have been in their office, hundreds of thousands of people who would have been in, in, in pubs and, and uh, betting shops are not there. And they're all one place. So we think there's a, a huge opportunity to reinvigorate what we do, reimagine it, and to create an atmosphere to make this a you know a totally unique children, but a special one that people remember for the right reasons rather than the wrong ones.